Barbed Wire Baseball by Marissa Moss. Zenny watched the wooden bat thwack the baseball, hurling it high and straight. He was eight years old, and it was the first time he'd seen a baseball game, but he was hooked. Father, I want to play, he told his dad. You're too small, his father said. Too frail, added his mother. But Zenny didn't listen. He had to play. The other kids laughed at him. Zenny, you're a mouse, one boy hooted. A teeny tiny one, another kid called. None of it mattered. When Zenny had a ball or bat in his hand, he felt like a giant, and soon he played like one. Many springs had passed since that first game, years of playing in the chill of winter and the sweat of summer. Zenny got taller and stronger and better at baseball. Why are you wasting time with a silly game, his mother asked. You should study and become a doctor, his father said, or a lawyer. But Zenny knew exactly what he wanted to do, and when he grew up, he coached, managed, and played baseball in the Fresno Nisei League and the Fresno Twilight League. He was barely five feet tall and weighed only 100 pounds, but he was a star player, casting a big shadow in baseball. Zenny was chosen to play with star members of the New York Yankees. He led his team in exhibition games in Japan. He even arranged for Babe Ruth to play there. But that world collapsed for him when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in 1941. For the first time since he had picked up a bat, Zenny felt as if he didn't measure up. The United States was at war with Japan, and 120,000 Americans of Japanese descent who lived on the West Coast were forced into 10 internment camps, most in the desert. The government considered these Japanese Americans to be possible spies and, without evidence or trials, locked them up, men, women, and children. American citizens all were treated like prisoners of war, housed in barracks and penned in with barbed wire. Zenny, his wife, and their two teenage sons were sent to a camp in Gila River, Arizona. Outside, the camp was bleak and gray and dusty. Inside, the barracks were stark, with crowded rows of cots and not much else. Families bustled around trying to make a home out of nothing, hanging up curtains, arranging tea sets on footlockers, piling dolls and stuffed animals on cots. Zenny stood staring at the dry earth, which was broken up every now and then by a few scrubby bits of green. In all the brown and gray, with a dull coppery sky overhead, he felt as if he were shrinking into a tiny, hard ball. There was only one thing that could make the desert camp a home, baseball. Zenny unpacked his favorite photo, the one that showed him in uniform lined up with baseball legends Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, towering like redwood trees beside him. He had played with the Yankee Stars in an exhibition game back home in Fresno, and he hadn't felt small at all. He pinned the picture up over his bed. He was going to play baseball again, here, in this desolate middle of nowhere. First, he would need a playing field. There was plenty of empty space, but it was dotted with sagebrush and clotted with rocks. It didn't look like much of a field. Zenny started by chopping down the plants and digging up the rocks, spending long hours in the blazing sun. What are you doing, Dad? His son Howard asked. Can't play baseball without a field, Zenny grunted. We're going to play baseball? Howard grinned and started picking up rocks too. Soon Howard's brother, Harvey, joined them. Then other boys and men drifted to where Zenny and his sons were bent over in the glaring heat. By the end of the day, dozens of people were working on the field, not planting a crop, but unplanting, making the ground a smooth surface. Once the brush and the big rocks had been cleared, Howard and Harvey were ready to set up the bases. Looks good, Howard said. We're almost set. Zenny shook his head. Nowhere close. We're making a real ballpark, and we'll do it right. He walked over to the camp commander's office. Ten minutes later, he emerged into the bright sun, smiling. We've got it, he clapped his hands. What, asked Howard, what have we got? A bulldozer to level the field, Zenny replied. The commander said we can borrow the camps. As Zenny drove the bulldozer, crowds gathered to watch. What's he doing, an old woman asked her grandson. He's making a baseball field, the young man answered. A baseball field, whatever for, she asked. Her son smiled so we can play. Once the ground had been smoothed, Harvey brought out his bat and ball. 
Now we can play, right? he asked. Zenny shook his head. He still wasn't satisfied. The wind kicked up so much dust from the dry soil that the players would be eating dirt. We have to do this right. He looked around the camp, hoping to find something to solve the dust problem. Then he got an idea. He diverted an irrigation line to the field and flooded it with water. Once the heat had dried the ground, the dirt was baked into clay, a clean, hard surface without all the dust. Now, Dad, asked Howard, tossing a ball between his hands. It looks great. Almost, Zenning answered, but we're not there yet. The irrigation line gave Zenny another idea. He laid pipe from the laundry room to the field and planted grass in the infield and quick growing castor beans along the edge of the outfield. The pipe fed water to the plants and soon the clay and grass took on the shape of a baseball field with a castor bean fence. Zenny smiled. Now it was beginning to look real. Come on, Dad, Howard urged. Can't we at least mark the bases now? Go ahead, Zenny agreed, but we're not done yet. Howard used flour to chalk the foul lines, and his mom sewed the bases from rice sacks. It's perfect, Harvey said. What about the spectators, the fans, Zenny asked. Where will they go? Both boys shrugged. Can't they just stand around, Howard asked. Or we could build rows of bleachers, Zenny said, like on a real baseball field. That night, Zenny and his sons snuck out of their barracks. They were not allowed outside after dark. Zenny felt like a boy again, tiptoeing out of the house with his bat and gloves so his parents wouldn't see him. A guard's light swept across the yard, and Zenny motioned to the boys to flatten themselves against the barracks. They waited for the beam to pass, then crept on. They didn't know that the guard had seen them, but the commander had told him to let them go so long as they didn't escape. The commander was curious to see what Zenny wanted now. The three of them scrounged wood from the fence surrounding the camp. They removed every other post, careful not to damage the fencing. Then they took wood from the camp lumber yard. That gave them enough material to build a backstop and five rows of bleachers behind it. The next day they set to work again, this time sawing wood and nailing boards. When Howard finished hammering the last row of seats, he wiped the sweat from his forehead and gaped at what they had made. There, in the middle of the desert, on the edge of an internment camp, was an official-looking baseball field. The rest of the place slumped, dreary and sad, but the baseball field glowed green with hope. Now, Dad? Harvey asked. Almost, Zenny smiled. We have the field. Now we need the equipment. He passed a hat among the families, collecting money for gear. In an hour, he had enough to send for bats, balls, mitts, and hats from Holman Sporting Goods back home in Fresno. Several women sewed uniforms out of potato sacks. When the box of equipment arrived, Zenny let Howard open it. Now, Howard, he said, now we can play ball. That first game on a bright May day, half the camp turned out to watch the teams that Zenny had organized. A breeze stirred the new grass. The sun bathed everything in a gentle warmth. It was a perfect day for a baseball game. 6,000 people filled the bleachers and spilled onto the scrubby ground behind them and along the sides of the stands. Zenny leaned over home plate, the bat held firmly in his hands. He looked at Howard, already on first base, at Harvey, now on second, at the neat white lines marking the field. His eyes scanned the bleachers filled with cheering fans. He watched the pitcher cradling the ball, pulling back his arm, getting ready to throw. Zenny focused on the blur of white as it zoomed closer. The weight of the bat felt so familiar and natural, it was like a part of his body. He waited until just the right moment. Whack! The bat met the ball with a crisp, splintering sound. Zenny threw the bat down and ran. He ran to first base, then second, then third, his eyes following the arc of the ball as it soared up and away, far over the barbed wire fence. Howard and Harvey jogged to home plate before him, arms raised, grins plastered on their face. Now, they yelled, now! Now, Zinni shouted back. He knew he was still behind a barbed wire fence, but he felt completely free, as airy and light as the ball he had sent flying. Right now, there was nothing else he wanted to do, just this, right now, right here. It didn't matter whether his team won or lost. Like the powerful champion he was, 
He felt that he could touch the sky if he wanted. Now, he roared as he crossed home plate. He felt ten feet tall, playing the game he loved so much. Nothing would ever make him feel small again. I thought I would share the afterword with you, too. Kenichi Zenimura, who lived from January 25th, 1900 to November 13th, 1968, was known as the Dean of the Diamond, the father of Japanese-American baseball. As a player, he excelled at all nine positions. As a coach and manager, he led his teams to victory after victory. Born in Japan, Zenny moved to Hawaii with his family when he was eight. There, he discovered the game that would shape his life. He played baseball throughout school and continued playing after he graduated and moved to Fresno, California. He founded the Fresno Athletic Club and won the Japanese American State Championship three years in a row. He went on to tour in Japan, popularizing the sport in his native country. When the Yankees came to Fresno to play an exhibition game in October 1927, four Japanese American players were picked for their teams. Zenny was among them. Then Pearl Harbor was bombed in 1941, and President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, authorizing the internment of all people of Japanese ancestry living on the West Coast. The coast seen as most vulnerable, being nearest to Japan and its powerful naval forces. Although they were loyal American citizens, they were considered dangerous, possible spies for Japan. Zeni and his family were sent to one of the ten camps the Gila River War Relocation Center in Arizona. Like the other camps, the center was fenced with barbed wire. Although it was later removed at the Gila camp, the barbed wire w was illustrated in this book to stress that this was a prison to the people there. Despite the harsh conditions, Zenny kept playing baseball, building a field out of nothing. He organized 32 teams into three divisions. Games were scheduled every day. When the camp closed in November 1945, the field was left to the desert creatures. Back home in Fresno, Zenny built a new ball field. After their experience playing ball in the internment camp, both of Zenny's sons went on to play big league baseball in Japan for the Hiroshima Carp. In July 2006, Kenichi Zenimura was posthumously inducted into the Shrine of the Eternals, the national equivalent of the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York but whose election of individuals is based on merits other than just statistics and playing ability. His son, Kenso Howard Zinamura, accepted the award on his father's behalf. I wanted to show you some pictures from the book too. So here's Zenny in the center, and he's with Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth. And here is a photograph of the baseball field that they built in Gila River, and finally, Here's a picture of Zenny in his baseball uniform. So I hope you enjoyed the book.